As I've already mentioned, we come to the second part of, the, um, of this last fundamental uh, this evening. And what we'll do is we'll read that passage of James, which I know is already very familiar. And I think it's, again, important that we get grounded in an understanding of what James is talking about here, that he's not talking about being justified by our works, being made acceptable to God through what we do, but he is talking about the evidence that we do have a faith that makes us acceptable to God. It is a faith that transforms us. It is a faith that will produce works, good works, in our lives. We will see the evidence. As a matter of fact, it's the, the, um, you might say it's the most powerful evidence, certainly the main evidence, that we are believers. It's not just that we believe and it's not that we think that we're trusting in Jesus, but it is that we are actually being changed by the Spirit of God into His image. So let's read about that in uh, James chapter 2 in verses 14 through 26. And this is what we read. James writes, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Essentially, it came to its completion. This is what faith is given to do, to change our lives, to make us believe and trust God and to act upon his word. Faith was perfected and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Well, may the Lord um, bless our hearing of his word this evening. May he bless the, the preaching of his word. Now this morning we saw that we are justified, declared righteous in the sight of God, acceptable to God, worthy to enter into heaven by grace alone. Remember, this is the hinge of the Reformation. This is upon which, the point upon which the church either stands or falls. We are justified by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his work alone, his life, his obedience, his atoning death, his work as our surety, as our guarantee of the blessings of the covenant. And in order that it may be by grace alone, we receive it by faith alone. We do not work for it. We receive it as a free gift so that God alone might receive the glory or the credit for this work. You see, we can't boast in this. This is something that God alone does. We also saw that to add any of our works to the gospel of grace destroys it. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 11:6. But if it is by grace, if it's a free gift, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And remember, we also ask the question, if we were to add something to the work of Christ, what could we possibly add to it anyway? Uh, Paul, who uh, essentially is his, his zeal for the Lord and his desire to, uh, to do what the Lord called him to do, outstripped all of his contemporaries as a Pharisee when he was unconverted. But as he looked back at all of his good works, he considered them to be not just worthless, but worse than worthless, to be absolute garbage in the eyes of the Lord. He writes in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 9, but whatever things were gained to me, as far as that righteousness, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count 
all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith I think you already know that word for rubbish there in the original means dung. Uh, that's why I mentioned this morning, you know, we, Christ offers us this, this precious gift. And we say, I don't want you to give it to me. I want to pay for it here. You can have everything that I've ever done for it. Here's my mountain of manure. Take that instead. Well, how does the Lord feel about that? Our works are filthy rags in His sight. They, they're not acceptable. It's, it's offensive. Because this gift is based upon the work of the Son, which is perfect and precious. So the word rubbish essentially means dung. It means garbage, worthless, worse than worthless, offensive. Now, we also saw that this is what every cult does, every Christian cult. They want to add their garbage to their justification. And that's exactly why they fall short. Now, they fall short in many other areas as well. But particularly here, and why we need to be careful not to do the same. We need to make sure we separate our works from this gift for our justification. Now this evening, let's look at the second point. That we are justified by grace through faith alone, but the second point, not by a faith that is alone. And this is James' point. The justifying faith that the Spirit of God gives to us does not leave us in the same condition in which it finds us. It transforms our lives into the image of Jesus. Now, remember we, we looked at this a bit this morning. Even though it's true that we are justified, we are accepted by God, by, uh, on the basis of the works of Jesus Christ alone, our works are still important. They're important. They're not meritorious, but they are important. Because this, these works, are what the Spirit of God produces in our lives when He is present in us in a saving way. His work in us moves us to work. Now, as I've said before, the works that He creates in us are not meritorious. You know, the Lord may, uh, he, he certainly will reward us on the basis of these things. Uh, they are pleasing in His sight. It's more pleasing that we do them than we don't do them but they do not earn anything towards our justification. They are the evidence of his work in us, of the faith he creates in us. He creates a living faith, one that shows itself to be alive through the works that we do. Now, we see this shot throughout all of Scripture, and, and I, I'm going to emphasize this because... Again, not because we don't understand it, but because there are many who, who still don't understand it and think that somehow to say that we have to do works, that there have to be works present in our lives, somehow destroys the gospel of grace. But let's see what the Bible says about what this new birth of the Holy Spirit, this work of grace, this, this impartation of this living faith actually does in our lives. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus. He said that the Spirit's work in our lives is what allows us to see the kingdom of God. In John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, and we know from the context that's referring to the Holy Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes to see the kingdom of heaven, in the king that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, to know that he is the king of a kingdom and the kingdom he speaks about is real and we see it as real through the work of the Holy Spirit. We're blind unless the Spirit opens our eyes. Now his work also allows us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Remember Jesus says in verse five, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus means by this is the Spirit of God gives us the ability to respond to the gospel that we hear, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and to enter the kingdom through faith in Him. Jesus actually calls this work of the Holy Spirit a resurrection. 
You know, in John chapter 5, Jesus is talking to the Jews about two resurrections. There's a resurrection that raises us from spiritual death to spiritual life. And then there is a resurrection that is coming in the future in which all who are in the tombs are going to go forth, uh, come forth and are going to be raised from the dead. But this first resurrection he speaks about was something that was taking place in his day and something that changed the course of one's life. He says in John 5, verses 24 through 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, Jesus is telling us here this work of the Holy Spirit, this new birth is like a spiritual resurrection. We come into the world dead. We come into the world spiritually dead because of what Adam did to us. We don't have the Spirit. We hate the things of the Lord. We're averse to these things. But His Spirit raises us to life as Jesus speaks, and He speaks through the gospel. This work of the Holy Spirit makes one, makes us who were dead now alive. Paul writes to the Ephesians, that they were spiritually dead. And the evidence that they were dead was that they were living just like the rest of the world. Uh, when they made their choices of what they wanted to do, they didn't look at the Word of God to say, this is what God wants me to do, so this is what I'm going to do. But instead they said, what do I feel like doing? I feel like, you know, I want to go do this. I want to do this, this evil thing or this sinful thing. And they just lived according to the desires of their flesh. And because of that, they were under God's wrath. But, Paul says... And again, this is one of the most important buts in the Bible, one of the most important exceptions, which also applies to us if we're trusting in Jesus. He says in verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians 2, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. When we were dead, the Spirit of God raised us to life. Now the Lord said the same thing in another way to the Jews in a way that they could relate to. In the book of Hebrews, quoting the prophecy of Jeremiah, the author to the Hebrews speaks of the Spirit's work of making us alive as writing the law of God that was written on stone onto our hearts, giving us the power to obey. This is what we read in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I know some people sort of... Uh, sort of get caught here on the idea that this covenant the Lord was making with the house of Israel. And they say that this covenant really is only for Israel. But let's not forget, God did make this covenant with Israel. He, the new covenant was promised to them. He promised to send the Messiah to his own first. And even after they rejected Jesus Christ, when he sent the apostles out to, to preach in various areas, they still went to the Jew first. And when the Jews rejected it, then they went to the Gentiles, but the fact is it did go to the Gentiles, the same blessing that was meant for Israel, the same covenant that God was making with them, so that we might enjoy the blessings that he meant for them through faith in their Messiah. I mean, we are getting in on the blessings that God meant for Israel, but these are blessings which are ours in the Lord Jesus. Now, the point, of course, behind all of this is this, that this new birth which is a spiritual resurrection, which is the writing of the law of God on our hearts, makes a difference in the way that we live. Remember our problem before was that we would not obey God. We were rebels against Him. We were His enemies. But now, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we do obey Him. Paul writes again to the Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, what we saw this morning. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But the result comes in the next verse, in verse 10, which was our meditation for this evening. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are justified by grace through faith alone. It's freely a gift of God, but notice the results. We are a new creation in Christ. We are His workmanship, and we are created for the purpose of doing good works, the very works that the Spirit of God wrote on our hearts, the law of God. He gives us the desire and the ability to do these things. Now, John puts it another way in 1 John 3, verses 9 through 10. What this will do is it will cause us no longer to practice sin, which is what we were doing before, but it will move us to do what is right. And not what we think is right, but what God thinks is right, what He knows is right. John writes in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So what is true of those born of God? They no longer give themselves to sin, but they give themselves to do what is right. Jesus came into the world to reverse the curse that Adam brought on us. Now, getting to James... James' whole argument here assumes and is based on that change of heart that we've just read about in all these different passages of Scripture. His, his whole argument is that faith will produce good works. If we have a saving faith, if we're truly trusting in the Lord, if we have been justified as Abraham who believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, I think we're all familiar with the problem that Martin Luther had with James in this particular area. Paul is so clear, as we saw this morning, on our justification being by grace through faith alone. And yet James seems to say that our works are involved in our justification. He writes in verse 24 of chapter 2, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Roman Catholicism bases its belief that we need to work for our justification. They don't believe that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're justified and that you're on your way to heaven. They believe that you have to work towards justification and God will not declare you to be just until you are, in fact, absolutely righteous. Well, that's not going to happen as long as you're here on earth. That's why virtually all of them have to go to purgatory in order to get purged of their sins and to be fit for heaven. They have to be justified in purgatory before they can go to heaven. They believe it's based upon this passage and they wonder how James could have made it any clearer than he did in this particular passage. Now the problem is that this understanding of James, that we have to work for our justification, flatly contradicts what Paul says about justification. They both cannot be true. And as Dr. Sproul reminded us on Wednesday as we were um, beginning to look at systematic theology, he said, since there is one author of Scripture who is consistent with himself and is not a confused God, he's only going to say one thing. Whatever the Bible says must be consistent. It must be unified. It's not going to have several different theologies. It's going to have one theology. So God, who is the author behind all of these things, all that's said in the Bible, is not going to contradict himself. So we know that it can't be by grace alone and by grace plus works. It has to be one or the other. Now, there's really no question as to what Paul is saying. As we read this morning in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We've already read several passages where he says, if it's by grace... It can't be by works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. So what is James telling us? That's really what we need to understand. Well, we need to see, first of all, that Paul, when he's talking about the justification of Abraham, 
He's quoting from an earlier episode in, in Abraham's life, in Genesis 15, verse 6, where we read that God gave Abraham a promise, and the promise was that he would give him a son, even though he was old and he hadn't had any children. And through the son, he would give him as many descendants as the stars in the heavens. And you know how old Abraham was before that, that particular promise was fulfilled? And yet, Abraham believed God, and he did not waver in unbelief, but knew that God was able to do this for him, and he had no doubt that he would. Now, remember, this promise included not just the son of promise and not just the numerous seed as the stars of the heavens, that many offspring, that many descendants, and that he would be the father of many nations, but it also included the coming of the Messiah. And Abraham saw Christ in that promise, and when he did, he was justified by believing in the Messiah. So that's what Paul is talking about when he refers to Abraham. Now, James also refers to Abraham, but he's talking about a later event in Abraham's life in Genesis 22 when the Lord called upon Abraham, put him to the test to take this child of promise that he had waited for for so many years and to offer him as a burnt offering. Now, what that means is he would, he would kill him and he would burn his body into ashes. That's what God was asking Abraham to do. And Abraham was willing to do this. But you know what? Abraham also knew that it was through Isaac that these descendants were going to come. And Isaac wasn't married. Isaac didn't have any children. And so Abraham knew that even if God calls me to do this, and even if he allows me to follow through with it, God is still going to raise Isaac from the dead, and he is going to fulfill this promise. That's how strong Abraham's faith actually was. But you see, when Abraham was willing to do this, he showed that his faith was a genuine faith, to be the kind of faith that justifies, because that kind of faith actually trusts God to do what he says he is going to do. You know, James also brings up the example of Rahab. She did the same thing. She exercised the same kind of faith when she hid the Jewish spies. Remember, they came in to spy out the land, and they came into Jericho, and they came into her house, and, and then the king sent messengers to try to get these spies and to arrest them, and Rahab had hid them on the roof and under some hay and so forth. And what she did was, at the risk of her own life, she sent the soldiers out on a wild goose chase for them because she believed... She protected them because she believed that God was giving the land to God's people, even as God said. That's interesting, isn't it? Here's this Gentile woman in the land of Jericho in this wicked city that was devoted to destruction that heard about what God was doing for his people and believed. You know, even though many of the Jewish people didn't believe, here was this Gentile woman who was a harlot who believed. And she was justified by that belief and her faith was shown to be genuine faith by doing whatever was necessary to protect these who were the messengers of God. Now, James is not telling us here that we are justified by our works, but what he's telling us is that our works justify or vindicate or prove that the faith we have is actually genuine faith. What James is telling us here is that if our faith does not produce any changes, if it doesn't produce any works, if it doesn't make us like Jesus, if we don't see that transformation taking place, then what we have is not a saving faith. We might have a historical faith. We might believe the facts are true, but we're not really trusting Jesus because that trust comes from a love the Spirit of God gives us for Jesus, which also gives us a love for all of God's Word. He writes, James does in James 2, 26, For just as the body without the Spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Okay, so if we have faith, it will be a working faith. If we have genuine faith, it will show itself to be genuine by producing these kinds of works. Now, the other question we might ask is this. I mean, who could possibly deny that that's what the Bible teaches? I mean, it's so, it's so clear. I mean, there may be some question in our minds regarding James, and perhaps we've struggled with that. But I don't think there's any question in our minds that if we believe in the Lord Jesus, it's going to change the way we live. I mean, that, that seems patently clear. But oddly enough, it isn't clear to everyone, even many within the Christian church who believe 
much of the truth regarding the gospel. There is a view that is called antinomianism that we saw when Ferguson was talking about the marrow controversy and so forth. The word antinomianism, remember, comes from two Greek words, the, the preposition anti, which, is, uh, which means against, can mean other things, but in this case it means against, and the word namas, which is the Greek word for law, and it means that you're opposed to the law, you're against the law. You don't think it's relevant for the Christian life. You don't think you have to obey it. There are people who believe that that's true of Christians. We don't have to obey this. And there doesn't have to be a change in our lives if we're genuinely trusting in the Lord Jesus. Now, we happened to, Don and I, go to a college that actually was teaching that view and, and I believe still believes that today. And when, at that time, we were going to that college, we became aware of a, of a theological debate that was taking place. We had to make a little room in our schedule to go see it, but it was, it was worth it. It was a meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society, and now we're dipping back a little bit into, into the past, but maybe some of you are familiar with it. Uh, at that particular meeting, there was debate that was going on. Dr. Earl Rodmacher, who was then the president of Western Conservatives Baptist Seminary, and then Dr. Robert Sosi, who was then the professor of systematic theology at Talbot Seminary, had come to debate Dr. John MacArthur, somebody we're familiar with, who had already created a stir on campus at, uh, at our college by writing this book that they considered to be heretical, The Gospel According to Jesus, but was stirring things up even further by writing a sequel to that book called The Gospel According to the Apostles, and he was there to present that, that work. Now, MacArthur was arguing this, that if we are saved, if we're truly saved, if we have been justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it will change our lives. It will produce works. Specifically, we will submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus will say this, and we will want to obey Him, and we'll want to do it from the heart because we love Him. Now, I was thinking, well, where's, where's the argument? It seems patently clear to me that that's what the Bible teaches. But those who were arguing with him did not agree with him. Uh, Rodmacher, in particular, argued that this was not true. And the place he went to to prove his point was James, the very passage that we just read. And he was arguing that it was possible to have a faith that does not produce works that is a saving faith. That this dead faith that James is talking about here, even though he calls it dead, is still able to save us. He actually argued that point, and he reasoned this way. If you have a faith that is dead, that means that once it was alive. And if you had a living faith at one time, then you must have been saved, you must have been justified by that, and since you can't lose your salvation, even now your, your faith is dead, you're still saved. And there's a lot of crazy stuff that came out of that movement. I mean, Dallas Seminary was producing uh, some pretty sad literature. Uh, again, who was the gentleman who uh, produced that one work as absolutely free? Zane Hodges. And he was arguing, you come to Christ, no change at all. Come to Christ, you can still be a rebel against God. Come to Christ, you can, you can devote your life to destroy and to tear down everything that Jesus stands for, and you're still going to go to heaven because coming to Christ does not change you at all. Now, as I've said, the college we were attending had exactly the same view, and we were reminded when we attended a memorial service a few years ago for a dear brother uh, who uh, you heard me talk about before, Hal Whitehead, who would come down and tirelessly witness to my dad, who was not a believer, uh, when he passed away, when he went to be with the Lord, um, we went to his memorial service and a very dear uh, friend of, of ours who was one of the professors at the college, one of the chairs of the department, presented a very antinomian gospel. Just come to Christ, just believe. There's no change. Just if you believe, you're, you're saved. Now the question is, again, why would they believe this? Now we know why Earl Rodmacher believes this. I, I haven't heard anybody else argue that point from, from James because that's the very thing he's arguing against, but he turns it around to make it an argument for his position. I, why, why are there others who believe this? Why, why did J. Vernon McGee, you know, through the Bible in five years, he, 
I heard him say exactly the same thing. You say that you have to change. You say there's going to be a change. You say you have to obey. You've destroyed the gospel. Why do they believe this? Well, it's because they don't understand the distinction that we actually made this morning between meritorious works, the works that earn justification, and necessary works, the works that show that we actually have been justified, that evidence of a changed life. They believe that if we say that works of any kind are necessary in any way to God's work of salvation, that we destroy the gospel. Now, we would agree with them if they said, if, if, if well, we would agree with them to say that to add works to our justification is to destroy the gospel, but we disagree with them when we say that the works must be there as the evidence of God's work in our lives by His Holy Spirit. So the idea is they just can't seem to make that distinction. They think if you add works, if you say they must be there, they have to be meritorious. We're saying they must be there, but they're not meritorious. They must be there as the evidence that you're saved. That transformation of life has to be there or you're not saved. But it does not earn your justification. It does not earn your entrance into heaven. Jesus did that alone. And we are saved by his grace alone. So that is the main area or the main reason why they believe this. But another area that they struggle with is this. Whether or not God's law is really relevant for the Christian. They see it as being a part of a covenant made with Israel. And because it was made with Israel, it's only for Israel. Only Israel has to keep the Ten Commandments. We don't have to keep the Ten Commandments because the church really has nothing to do with the covenants that God made with Israel. But you know, that isn't true. We already saw just a few moments ago that what we enjoy as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are the blessings of the new covenant, the covenant that God made with Israel the covenant that he intended for Israel. Um, those are the blessings we get in on because we have received the Messiah. We have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and have trusted him. And one of the blessings that he gives us in the new covenant that we've seen is the power to keep that law by writing it on our hearts, giving us the Holy Spirit. So again, that's another thing they struggle with and they, they say, no, there's really, we don't have to really do anything only Israel has to do the commandments. We don't have to keep the commandments. But there are also other reasons why professing Christians reject God's law. Some who have a more charismatic persuasion believe that the Spirit has superseded the law of God. Now that I have the Spirit of God to lead me, all I have to do is kind of discern what He's doing in me, what He wants me to do. Oh, I think He wants me to do this. And so they go over and they do this, okay? Well, there, what's the problem with that? <laughs> How do you know where those inclinations are coming from? We have two sets of inclinations, one by the Spirit, one by the flesh. Which one is it? Well, the only way we can know is by the Word of God. And the fact is that we are to follow the Spirit of God. We are to yield to the Spirit of God. But it's also true the Spirit of God leads us according to God's law. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, and here when he's talking about what the law could not do and what God did through his son and so forth, what the law could not do, he means when it was written on stone. It could not give us the power to obey, but now that he's given us the spirit of God, we have that power. Listen to what he says. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, that is our flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law, what law? The Ten Commandments, might be fulfilled in us, that is, give us the power to do it, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit to fulfill the law of God in us, to give us the power to do it. That's what it means that he writes it on our hearts. And there are still others who argue that because God, when he saves us, we're saved forever. We can never lose our salvation. It really doesn't matter how we live. We can live any way we want to and still go to heaven. So why does it matter whether we obey or not? I mean, that kind of goes along with the view we saw at the beginning, which is when the Lord saves us, it doesn't change our lives at all. 
But we do need to remember that Jesus, one of the reasons he came into the world was not only to, was not only to take away our guilt so we wouldn't be condemned, but it was to break the power that sin had over us and to set us free from sin so that we no longer had to obey it. If we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that power is broken. Paul writes to the Romans in chapters 6, verses 5 through 7. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, which we are for trusting him, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self, the old man, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Remember what John said earlier? That if we are born of God, we don't practice sin anymore. We now practice righteousness. That's because we have been set free from sin. We're no longer in bondage to sin. Now we are set free in the liberty of the children of God to be able to obey the Lord. If we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, sin can no longer command us. We are free from its power. Now, the last question that we need to ask is this. Can those who believe that we can be true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and be absolutely unchanged and even become enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ, can those who believe these things and teach these things actually be saved? Okay. Well, I think John Gerser answered the question well, and he answered it in this way. He said they are saved if they are trusting Jesus and if that trust is producing the works that James tells us should be produced in their lives. If they're trusting Jesus and they have the fruits and the evidence of the Spirit of God living in them, then they're saved. And if they actually believe the Bible teaches that, even though it doesn't teach that, if that's what they believe the Bible teaches and their conscience is bound by that, yes, they can be saved. Even though they hold that position, they can be saved. But he would also add this, because that teaching that they teach can and will lead people to hell, they are not fit to be in the Christian ministry. They should not be teaching. The church would be better off and the people who listen to them would be better off if they would just simply remain silent, but they don't do that. That's the problem. That belief that we are unchanged by the gospel undermines the gospel. It actually can destroy it. It is heretical. Remember the idea that uh, there are lots of errors. I mean, everybody has errors in certain areas in their thinking as far as what the Bible teaches. But errors that destroy the soul those are called heresy. And the idea that we can be saved and be completely unchanged, produce no works at all. Jesus said, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, what happens to it? Gets cut off, gets gathered, and thrown into the fire. Okay? It's quite clear. If we don't produce works, if those works aren't being produced in our lives, we really do not know the Lord. And if we teach otherwise, we are leading people astray from the truth. And that could condemn them. It's the same thing as telling them that God is only one person or that Jesus isn't God or that we're saved by our works. I mean, it, it, it undermines the gospel, so it is heretical. They may be believers, but what they're teaching is heresy. They shouldn't be teaching it. They would be better to remain silent. So we need to remember, just to recap everything, that the Father gave us the law for our good because he loves us, because he wants us to know how we can love him and how we should be loving one another. When we fell away from him by breaking his law and became, and became rebels against him, he sent his son into the world to fulfill it by obeying it himself so that the son might be able to send his spirit into the world, into our hearts, to give us the power also to keep it so that we might walk in the light as he is in the light. We are justified, we are accepted by God, by grace, through the work that Jesus did alone. And we receive it by faith alone, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, not through our works, so that it may be by grace alone. That's the only way it can be by grace alone, is if we receive it by faith alone, which is not a work, but it's a looking away from ourselves to Jesus and receiving what he has done for us.
But let's not forget the second point. The faith that the Spirit of God gives us to trust in Jesus does not leave us in the same condition in which it finds us. It transforms our lives and makes us more like Jesus. And remember what Jesus is like. He is one who loves his Father and desires his glory. That's what the Spirit of God will do in us. Give us the same love for the things that glorify him so that we move in that direction. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, help us to apply what we've heard.